The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, our goal is to conclude an age-old scriptural question. The question and answer detailed by the revelation and sufficiency of scripture is, How will I or any sinful and fallen human behold God's face in righteousness? By what means can I hope to awake with God's likeness? Is it by me keeping the law? Is it by my good deeds outweighing my bad deeds? Or is it perhaps the depth of my sincerity in making the effort? Now, in our first episode, as you will recall, we went back in the history of God's revelation to Genesis chapter 1 and looked at God's creation and what he had accomplished there and proclaimed to be very good and that he had finished all of his work on the sixth day and rested on the seventh day. We subsequently saw Adam and Eve being tempted and falling into sin by attempting to eat the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and to thereby assume God's likeness through their own works and efforts and failing as a result thereof which took us all the way to the incident at Mount Sinai where God delivered his commandments to Moses and to God's people. We saw that those commandments were broken even before they reached the people as a type of showing how man is incapable of receiving, much less keeping God's laws. Subsequently, the second set were in fact kept inside the Ark of the Covenant which is a type of Christ, showing us in substance that Christ is the only one who, as God, can keep, because of his nature, the laws of God, being that he is God in the flesh. We saw the purpose of the law in that 
the law was meant to be a schoolmaster or a tutor to in fact show us that we're incapable of keeping the law and to therefore bring us to Christ who is the solution to that situation to reconcile us to God. We saw God's analogy of the law being like the law of marriage wherein as long as one is married to their spouse, they must be faithful to their spouse. But when the spouse is deceased, we are no longer under that situation. We are free from whatever rules and regulations that we had to maintain. And now we are free to enter into a new relationship. Likewise, we saw the substance of that, which is when we are dead buried with Christ in his crucifixion. Our sin and our old nature is buried with him, and we are no longer under the obligation to keep the old relationship to the law. Now we are raised with Christ. We have a new nature, and we are alive through him, and we live now according to this righteousness which he imputes to us. We saw that there was a methodology through the tabernacle in the wilderness and the, and the uh, temple itself wherein God prescribed a particular method by which we approached God and made reconciliation to God and that that tabernacle in the wilderness and the temple uh, itself both pointed to Christ and his what he accomplished in his propitiatory sacrifice on the cross. We saw that that same situation which began the event is in fact the same methodology which continues the progress. We are not intended to return back to the old spouse. We're not intended to return back to circumcision. We're not attempted to return back to uh, the works of the law, we are to continue in that relationship with Christ and to his imputed righteousness in our life and to his sanctifying grace day by day. Finally, in our second episode, we ended the episode asking the question, saying, since Christ paid the price for all of our sin, past, present, and future, does this mean that you and I, that we can count on this as a get-out-of-jail-free card and commit intentional, worry-free sin? To that question, I began to point out that Paul comes to the rescue in Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18, which we were about to read. In verse 15, it says, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death, or obedience leading to righteousness? But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. Now to this, we ask a question. How is this possible? Paul comes to the rescue in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, which says, For you, we, were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, when by God's grace we come to an abiding relationship with Christ and his finished work, Christ's atoning work fully purchases us from bondage under Satan and the slave market of sin. We are purchased by his blood, and we are now bond slaves, doulos in the Greek, to Christ, and we serve him and his nature, which is righteousness. Now, perhaps at this point you are still unconvinced. Perhaps you still think in some way or shape, that in order to please God, that you need to keep the law, or that in order to get to heaven, you need to merit God's grace. Okay, 
Well, let's let Paul again speak here on the matter. And let's go to Romans chapter 4, and let's begin at verse 21, where Paul asks a rhetorical question. He says there in verse 21, Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise. Which things are an allegory, for these things are two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Hagar. Okay, so heads up here. Paul is telling us of the story of Abraham, Sarah, Hagar, Ishmael, and Isaac found in Genesis chapter 21, verses 8 through 21, and that these verses are a type pointing towards a substance. Let's continue in verse 25. For this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer is, to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So, here's the translation. Hagar and Ishmael are the type whose substance is Mount Sinai in Arabia, where the covenant of the law which we saw in episode 2 was given, and is likened to Jerusalem, where the law found its zenith. These all are the children of Ishmael and Hagar, who are under bondage. We contrast this to the Jerusalem, which is above, i.e. heaven, which is the covenant of grace, which is the child of promise, i.e. Isaac, who is free, and the mother of all those who live in Christ according to faith. Continuing in verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath a husband. Now we brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was at born after the spirit, even so it is now. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. So let's recall, the question was that there are those that still think that in order to please God, that we need in some fashion or form to keep the law in order to merit God's grace and to get to heaven. However, looking at Paul's analogy there given in Galatians 4, we see once again that God intended that Abraham would inherit God's promise by simply maintaining faith in God. As you'll recall, God had promised Abraham that he and Sarah would have a child and that their children would ultimately outnumber the stars. Yet, in the midst of all that, Abraham and Sarah were barren for many, 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 many years. So, having given that promise, Abraham was forced to have faith in what God had said despite the circumstances. And Abraham did have faith. But at the same time, we see that Abraham succumbed to weakness and attempted, like Adam and Eve, to add his own efforts 
to fulfill God's promise, and in doing so, we see that Abraham ultimately produced Ishmael through Hagar, who, along with Hagar, are the type of bondage. Just so, when we add works to faith, we, like Abraham, invariably diminish faith, and we father bondage in our lives. The law, our own works, efforts, are all on the other side of a spiritual demilitarized zone. Once we cross back over that line, we bring ourselves back into bondage to the entirety of the law, and we become children of Hagar who are in bondage. It is only when we stay on this side of the line, and as verse 30 says, cast out the bondwoman and her son, that we are free. We do this by being like Isaac, who was born after the Spirit, according to God's grace. So, we have looked at the past. We have examined the present. Now, what about the future? Is there ever a time in future when we can stand before God and boast that we are there, that we are righteous because of our works, our merits, our efforts? Or is it always by God's grace and mercy? Well, perhaps you are still having difficulty and you are just sure that yes, Jesus saved me via faith in his finished work, but, but, now that you are saved, you are somehow perfected by adding the law of Moses. Okay, well, the prosecution would like to recall Paul to the witness stand. What does he have to say? Galatians chapter 3, beginning at verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteousness because of his faith. The real children of Abraham, then, are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures looked forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be the righteous because of their faith. God proclaimed this uh, good news to Abraham long ago when he said, All nations will be blessed through you. So, all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of faith. But, those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For the scriptures say, Cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. 
So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. Okay, so we see clearly that from multiple sources of scripture, that the law, the knowledge of good and evil, can only serve to convict us that we are fallen short and we cannot, cannot be like God despite what Satan said because only God is perfect. All we can do, whether we are in the Garden of Eden or the cross of Christ, is to rest in the finished work of God. Now, for the final curtain, I would bring you to Revelation chapter 5, verses 1 through 14. Here, according to chapter 4, for context, we join John, who was called up in verse 1 to the throne room of heaven. Then we move to chapter 5, verse 1, where we begin. And I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll written inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loose its seals? And no one. Let's read that again and no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look at it. So I wept much because no one was found worthy to open and read the scroll or to look at it. But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. And I looked and beheld, and behold, in the midst of the throne and of the four living creatures and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as though it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. Then he came and took the scroll out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. Now when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as is in the sea and all that are in them, I heard saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the twenty-four elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and and ever. So thus we see that the past, the present, and the future throughout eternity declare the same message that salvation is a work designed and accomplished in time.
entirely by God alone. Ultimately, it was this and the fullness and sufficiency of Scripture which during the 16th century brought Martin Luther and other men of the Reformation to realize that the then existing Roman Catholic system of elaborate works obscured obscured the person and work of Christ so clearly taught in Scripture. As the Swiss reformer Huldrych Zwingli proclaimed, quote, Christ is the only way of salvation of all who were, are now, or shall be, unquote. In Article 54 of his 67 Articles in 1523, Zwingli states, quote, Christ has borne all our pain and travail. Hence, whoever attributes to works of penance what is Christ's alone, errs, and blasphemes God, unquote. In conclusion, the great theologians of the Reformation who wrestled with the issue of salvation being a result of the works of the law versus grace concluded the matter with the five solas which summed up the heart of the Reformation. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, according to Scripture alone, for God's glory alone. This concludes this series of episodes. If you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I would encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. Yeah.